explain how it is that there's been an enormous amount of opposition to the Rwandan solution, as Peter says, not just from the Labour Party, also from Tories. There have been human rights lawyers of all different kinds saying these planes will never take off because every time they're about to, we will stop them on the tarmac. It's never really going to happen. And then we've had all of this toing and froing, this ping pong with the House of Lords, the upper chamber. And yet, despite all that barrage of opposition, it looks as if this will now happen. So does it mean that it's all quite pointless and the government just gets to do whatever it wants to do? How is all that opposition somehow now irrelevant and not impeding it? The, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. I mean, th the whole thing has always been a facade. The whole thing has always been a, a, a gimmick. Um, so the, 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 the opposition to it has been about saying, this isn't going to work. It's not going to reduce the number of people who are desperately trying to come here, who are endangering their lives by go coming over on small boats. Um, and the number of people who are going to end up in Rwanda is, what, 500? Yeah, yeah maximum, few hundred, um, a, few a few hundred. Under the current deal, but that could then change. Mm -hmm. OK, sure, yeah. But, like, uh, you know, given the uh, enormous disruptions that we've already seen in Rwanda um, and all of the things that have gone wrong with it so far, I don't think we any of us can feel particularly optimistic about that. Let's bear in mind also that, you know, um, whilst Rwanda has been training people up in order to implement our British government policy for us. They've also been massacring innocent people um, in the DRC and looting their homes. Um, so I'm not really sure that this is a government that we should be have, uh, have much trust with. When the Israeli government tried to do a similar kind of deal with them several years ago, they lied to them and messed it up. Um, you know, th the whole thing is a, a, a gimmick just to get Rishi Sunak to the next election when he can say that he's done something. It's not going to achieve anything. What it will do, and this is what it's all about, mm -hmm. is create the impression that Rishi Sunak is willing to be really cruel and nasty to some very desperate people. Whether or not you think that they um, should get asylum in this country, they're definitely desperate people, and Rishi Sunak's definitely proving that he'll be really cruel to them. All well right. done, him. So, Charlie, you know, this is obviously Richard's analysis. You're sitting right next to him. I wonder whether you see it from the same point of view or whether you think that this might be Rishi's finest hour, his saving grace. It might be the thing that suddenly rebrands him and recalibrates him in public imagination, that if he can just get a few people, and as Richard says, desperate people, I'm certainly not going to argue with him on that one. I think it'll be pretty damn desperate to come over on a small boat, whatever your motivation. It's got to be partly desperation that fuels it. Otherwise, you don't do that sort of thing and knowingly risk your life. It has to be desperate people. I don't think that is a controversial view. I think that's absolutely a sensible response from Richard on that particular part of his response to this, this, this plan. But, 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 you know, the idea that if he gets a few desperate people on a plane to Rwanda, this might be just the ticket. Is that what you think? Do you think it's got to work for him? And if it does, it will be a kind of golden victory of some sort? Well, I think um, a lot of things. I don't agree that it's a gimmick. Um, uh, but I also don't uh, agree that it's something that anybody probably would have wanted to have. Mm. Um, I think Oliver Dowden said in an interview um, a, a few months ago that nobody would really want to have a Rwanda policy uh, or something so extreme as we've got. But mm. the situation is so bad where you see thousands upon thousands of people coming into the country illegally, you need to look uh, to new measures where at every opportunity the Labour Party has voted down uh, efforts to tackle migration, whether it's legal or illegal. Uh, we now have a policy that is in shape, that is in place, uh, where Rwanda is a safe country, uh, where a lot of work has gone into, I think, making sure that the people that do go there uh, will be treated This is despite the fact that our own Supreme Court said it was not a safe country. And our were... own court, the one that we're meant to obey and believe in and abide by its decisions, that's where it wasn't some strange alien foreign court. It wasn't the, you know, much deplored European court. It was our own. Our own Supreme Court here said, no, it's not a safe country, and then you're sitting here, and so is Rishi Sunak standing over there saying, it is a safe country. And I think the ruling that the Supreme Court came to was on a technical uh, a technicality rather than an overriding uh, statement that Rwanda simply isn't safe. If it wasn't safe, right. I don't think the UK government, well, I certainly wouldn't be supporting the UK government or any government that wants to send people to somewhere that isn't safe or where there aren't those protections but, but, but in place. But, it, but the people... But, but, the people, but, 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 is, it but, but also, though, is it true, hmm. though, Charlie, that there still isn't really any sort of coherent... And you can all pitch in on this one, that, that, that there isn't really a coherent plan for what is meant to happen to those people 
once they finally get off the plane I, I think there is at a the plan. airport. I, what is meant to happen to them? Well, the plan is that they go and live there and that they are processed and that they, they live in Rwanda. That's the plan and they can't come back. They can't ever come back. They can't ever come back, but is no. there work for them there? Is there any kind of... Uh, you know, industry that they can join? Yeah, Are there well, any kind I mean, of Rwanda structures been... to, to kind of employ them and give them a, a life? Well, Rwanda has been given a lot of money to get these people into work and to get them to have some sort of life there. You can certainly argue, as, as, the, as, the, as my two fellow panelists have, in terms of whether it's a safe country or not. And actually, uh, the point, I mean, you're... You're right in that it was a technical thing, but to be very, very clear with the Supreme Court, they were essentially saying that Rwanda wasn't a safe country and now the legislation is saying, well, actually it is, and that's what makes it a safe country. I don't think much has materially changed in relation to the safety or otherwise of Rwanda. I mean, we've got a country, Rwanda, where people, where political opponents get tortured, yeah, where people get beaten up um, in uh, by the police on a very frequent basis. I've spoken to people like that in my um, as part of my other role. Um, uh, and then we've got in the UK uh, a, a government that thinks that the right way to push through public policy is to have a law that says black is white and white is black. You know, it's like 1984. Um, what is particularly appalling about this is that there are actually some sort of fairly simple, not cheap, but fairly simple things that we could be doing right now to start dealing with the problem at home, right? We have a huge backlog in this country. That is because... George Osborne, uh, David Cameron and the Conservative Party defunded our, our border services. So you don't have proper funding for the people who are supposed to be processing these claims. That's why you have loads of people in hotels on the South Coast, because they, they can't move. They're not allowed to go anywhere else. Well, and they're not allowed jobs. They're not allowed, to ha they're not allowed to look after themselves. So that some of them are living on seven quid a day. Let's just check with Peter. You don't think this is No, I, I agree with Richard. Richard's absolutely right. He's factually, right, and what he's he? talking yeah. about, what Rishi Sunak was, was keen to point out today, uh, was that a number of those hotels have now been given back. The processing has been sped up. But you're absolutely right. There is a processing yeah. crisis in this country. But the point of the Rwanda policy is not really about processing. It's not even really about, uh, it's not even really actually about uh, the lives of people, uh, uh, sending a huge number of people to Rwanda. The point that Rishi Sunak would say mm. is that it is about uh, a deterrent effect to say that you might be sent to Rwanda. A lot has been criticised hugely by saying actually there's a very small chance of being sent to Rwanda and certainly you won't be sent unless you're a single man. No mm. families will be sent, for example. No women or children will be sent. So whether the deterrent works or not is another matter. But actually, uh, the reason Keir Starmer, and I would imagine Richard are calling it a, a gimmick, although I don't want to put words in your mouth, is that it is such a small policy affecting such a small yes. number of people. And the real problem and the real thing that we need to deal with is why are these people coming across in the first place? How are they getting across? And to disincentivize them in some way from doing yes. so.